You can escape a town, but you cannot escape blood. Somehow, the Vignes twins believe themselves capable of both. And yet, if, this, if Alphonse de Sor could have strolled through the town he'd once imagined, he would have been thrilled by the sight of his great, great, great granddaughters. Twin girls, creamy skin, hazel eyes, wavy hair. He would have marveled at them. For the child to be a little more perfect than the parents, what could be more wonderful than that? You just heard Britt Bennett reading from her best-selling novel, The Vanishing Half, published in French as L'Autre Moitié de Soi by L'Autre Mont. Britt Bennett joins us now to tell us more. Britt, thanks so much for being with us. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, The Vanishing Half has been a runaway success. It went straight to the top of the New York Times bestseller list when it came out, critically acclaimed. And the story set in the town of Mallard, Louisiana. And when I read about it, it serves your characters so perfectly that I thought this town just must be fictional. But I believe you're inspired by a real place. Can you explain? Yeah, it came from, uh, the idea from the book came from a conversation with my mother telling me about a town she remembered hearing about as a child growing up in Louisiana. Um, so it was inspired by the idea of this real place, but I was able to, uh, I think, play into the kind of mythology that that was the way that my mother described it to me. It felt so mythological when she was telling me about this place. So I, I wanted to lean into that as I was writing the book. And it's a town where colorism is really a big deal. They really prefer people with lighter skin. And the two protagonists, Stella and Desiree, are twins who spend all of their time together until at one point their paths diverge and Stella lives her life as a white woman, she decides to. Now this theme of passing has often been dealt with in literature uh, by Nella Larson, for example, Philip Roth has written about it, but their characters are often punished for this untruth. Bad things happen to them sometimes. What about your character, Stella? How is the experience for her? Yeah, I was interested in, in not writing a story that was about punishing Stella. I didn't want to judge her I didn't want to condemn her for this choice. I really wanted just to explore what that psychological journey is for her. What does it mean to decide to become this new person? And, and what is the, what do you, how does that liberate you? And also how does that, uh, how is that something that you have to reckon with throughout your life? And the idea that individuals can embrace, decide upon their own identity, that they're self-determining is really present in your novel when it comes to race, gender, but also class, professional success, that sort of thing. That seems to be a very American notion, the land of the free, the free to decide, if it were. Do you think America is still a place of civil liberties? Oh, that's tough. <laughs> I mean, I do think that what you're saying is there is uh, there is something deeply American, I think, about this idea of passing, um, because it is an idea about determining who you want to be, deciding who you want to be. But there's also a long history of passing uh, with an American context, whether it's racial passing or whether it's immigrants changing their names uh, when they arrived in Ellis Island so that they would hide that they were immigrants. There's such a long history of that. So I do think that that's something that's deeply woven into our national mythology, the idea of creating yourself. Uh, but I think it's something that's fraught. It's fraught in the book, and I think it's something that's still fraught today. Indeed, it's complex, because one of your characters is a trans man, Reese, who embraces that gender identity. Now, transgender rights have been in the news recently after J.K. Rowling's remarks about the quote-unquote lived reality of women. And the literary world was really divided about that issue. Uh, some supported the Harry Potter author and others like uh, Margaret Atwood, uh, Roxane Gay, Stephen King, came out in support, solidarity with transgender people. What do you think about the whole issue? Would you ever feel the need to get drawn into that sort of debate? Uh, I mean, I think that she's wrong. <laughs> I think uh, I think that a lot of her comments were very offensive. Um, and I think for me, it was personally disappointing um, as someone who grew up reading Harry Potter to see that uh, somebody who has shaped the imaginations of children has proven her own imagination and understanding of the complexity of other people to be so limited. So I think it's, it's, it's sad, it's disappointing, and I'm, I feel really uh, sad for, for trans fans of Harry Potter who feel like they've kind of lost something of, in, in a lot of the comments that she's made that have been very dehumanizing towards the trans community. Now, I believe you started writing The Vanishing Half in 2014. That was during the Obama administration. And since then, some of the questions you raise in the novel have come center stage, questions of racism, institutionalized violence against minorities. They've become political questions and issues that have also been played out in the streets, at rallies, at the Black Lives Matter protests. 
did you see that coming when you wrote the book? I mean, I, I think certainly not in the way in which, you know, my book came out in the U.S. the week that the George Floyd protests really started in earnest. And I didn't, I don't know that I saw that moment happening or necessarily the fact that people would turn to books in that moment in the way that people have. But I certainly think that, you know, during the whole time I was working on this book, the idea of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, that was something that was present. Um, and the questions that the book engages with are questions that people have been asking for decades, if not centuries, about race in the United States. So there's a way in which the moment, I think, was a little surprising to me, but also a way in which I think I was always writing within that moment. Indeed, a lot of the action in the book takes place a long time ago, in the 1950s or 60s, the Jim Crow, a segregated South. It does feel like a long time ago. It sounds like a long time ago. But did you notice parallels with modern American society while you were writing about that historical period? I think a bit. I think for me, I wanted to write about that time from my perspective as a 21st century writer and from somebody who uh, maybe takes for granted a little bit these ideas that that identity is really fluid. That was a given as I was working on the book. And I think that that is something that I don't know that people would have embraced uh, as much during the time in which the book was set. But I think also the book opens in 1968, which is a year that everyone is talking about, uh, at, at least in the U.S. this year, because it was a year of so much social division and, and uh, you know, a year of lots of protests, a lot of lots of upheavals, an election year, all of these these echoes that are, uh, I think, reminding people of that time. And that was just the year that the book happened to open. Now, there's one moment in the book that really struck me when one character suggests that being white is the same as being free, that the two words mean the same thing. And speaking of white privilege, in 2014, you wrote an essay entitled I Don't Know What to Do with Good White People about the sort of virtue signaling behavior from liberal white people that shifts the focus onto them. What do you think the danger is about that sort of attitude? I mean, I think for that essay, I really was just grappling with that question of good intentions. You know, how much are your good intentions worth if, if they harm people or if they don't help people, if it's just about making yourself feel good? Um, and I think to me, I think there's something that can be, uh, you know, harmful, I think, to to everybody. It's, it's not helpful. Uh, white guilt does not help anybody. It's a very... Uh, it's a very self-serving emotion. <laughs> so I think there can be something frustrating, you know, from my standpoint of seeing these kind of performances of, of white decency, but I also think ultimately it's not helpful. It doesn't actually, uh, you know, create equality for anybody. It's just something about making yourself feel better. Now, right now is an important moment in the United States. Americans are currently deciding on whether Donald Trump is to stay in the White House for a second term. The first time you voted as a young adult in 2008, uh, Barack Obama was elected, a movement that the rest of the world saw as a hugely progressive step. Twelve years on, on the brink of another election, what has changed in the United States, in your opinion? Oh, I mean, I think a lot, I, it, that's hard to say. Um, you know, I think that uh, I think a lot of ways the Trump presidency is a direct response to the Obama presidency. It's this kind of backlash that always happens in American politics, American history, where there's some moment of incremental progress and there's an immediate backlash to that progress. Um, so I think that that's a lot of what, what has happened during this moment. But I think that Trump has you know, illustrated a lot of longstanding beliefs uh, that a lot of people have had about race and gender. Uh, a lot of these mo uh, moments of inequality that he's sort of exacerbated, it's not that he caused them. He, he's kind of a symptom of what has already been this longstanding disease in American politics and American culture. And going to the polls in this election, what sort of social, political issue do you think is really the most important? What's at stake here? I mean, I think everything is really at stake. I think the state of our, you know, whether America will be a democracy or not is really at stake. Um, I think the most immediate thing is COVID. I think, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that we've already had over 200,000 people dead, um, that the people dying are, are our most vulnerable, you know, disproportionately people of color, uh, poor people, older people, the fact that children cannot go to school, the fact that businesses are shutting down, people are, you know, losing their health care, losing their homes. I'm hoping that people will take a look at what has happened, uh, if nothing else, for the past four years. We'll take a look at where we are right now in this moment and what has happened over this past year compared to lots of other parts of the world that have figured out some way to at least mitigate some of the damage from COVID and see how horribly we have mismanaged it because of a lack of leadership and also 
yeah, I mean, an entire lack of leadership, an unwillingness to sacrifice, to make any type of communal sacrifice to keep people safe. The Vanishing Half is being adapted into a series by HBO, and they had to outbid 17 other TV companies to secure the rights to that, which will be fascinating to see on screen. But how do you feel about your literary creations, your characters, your babies, in a way, having a TV life and reaching a new, a different audience? I'm really excited about it. I think, like you said, it reaches a new audience, people who may not have come to the book. And I think also there's something really exciting for me as a novelist who's used to working in such a solitary way uh, to be part of a project that is collaborative and to be part of a project that's about involving lots of different voices and lots of different people and seeing how all of those voices will, will translate this book and transform it into something that's different than the book that had just been living alone in my head for all those years. Now, finally, we asked you for a cultural tip, something you've really enjoyed recently, and you named the series I May Destroy You, starring and written by Michaela Cole. What was it about this series that so impressed you? Um, I just think Michaela Cole is a genius. <laughs> um, I th felt that way even back, like back when she was doing Chewing Gum. Um, I, I think that the show is so bracing. You know, it's about sexual violence and the aftermath of it. Um, and you see this character, a lot of the characters in the show who are reeling uh, with the, the aftermath of this trauma and that feels like something that's really heavy and at times it feels so heavy to watch but also there are moments that are so comedic and funny and absurd and I think that the finale it's unlike any se series finale that I think I've ever seen the finale is amazing so it lands really well um, it'll make you laugh it'll make you cry it'll make you cringe uh, it's just a great show definitely worth watching during lockdown <laughs> a very good tip indeed thank you so much for joining us Britt Bennett it was a pleasure thanks, thanks for having me We'll wrap up with a clip of I May Destroy You, which is currently streaming on HBO. Do check in with us next time here on On Call for more arts and culture. And you can keep up with us on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. There's so much injustice and my job is to speak the truth. Thank you for what you're doing. I love you too. I caught the wave, I caught the wave. I caught the sharks and they swim with the fishes.